Ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to welcome you to our inaugural episode of Richmond Ballet in real time. Over the next few weeks, I'm gonna be giving you an insider sneak peek into everything behind the scenes with Richmond Ballet and introduce you through a few fun virtual visits to some of the people that make all the magic happen within our amazing organization. Even as we stay at home, you can rely on Richmond Ballet to provide you with a variety of virtual live streaming classes and dance related content. For more information, make sure to check out richmondballet.com and our social platforms. I'm your host, Valerie Tillman Henny, otherwise known as Valerina the Ballerina, and this is Richmond Ballet in real time. Today, I am over the moon thrilled to introduce you to our very first guests on Richmond Ballet in real time. Richmond Valley Resident Conductor, Director of Choral Activities with Virginia Commonwealth University, Director and Conductor of Richmond Symphony Chorus, and Artistic Director of Wintergreen Arts. Welcome, the one and only Miss Erin Freeman. Welcome to the studio, I mean the show. We're so excited to have you on today. Thank you for joining us. Erin, in preparation for this interview, I did some research on um, female conductors in America, and it is grim. Tell me about that. Yeah, you know, we are small in number. And, you know, when I, when I think about it, I, I, it, it, it is a little grim. But I think we're starting to turn the corner. If you look at the Richmond Symphony's conducting staff now, out of the four of us, three of us are women, including mm -hmm. our new music director, Valentina Pelleggi, who is just amazing and i know she did some work with the richmond ballet yes congratulations ballet earlier yeah so um you know i was fortunate enough to grow up in schools and in programs that didn't tell me that there was a disparity or if they did tell me there was a disparity they they encouraged me nonetheless and so the the only thing I really noticed when I was studying to be a conductor was that the restroom at conducting conferences, you know, the line for the ladies room was always short, which was great. That's one perk. I know it is one perk. Um, but, but other than that, you know, it was only until later that I started to realize that there was um, a, a disparity and a, and a sense that there was a little bit of a struggle. But again, here I have felt so supported by the Richmond Ballet and the Richmond Symphony and Wintergreen. All my, all my places have been supportive and I have some incredible female role models as leaders, uh, Stoner being one of them. I just look up to her and I model most of my leadership on the way she runs the Richmond Ballet. Yes, yeah, she is amazing. Women are amazing, period. Yeah. Um, so I have another question for you. Did you grow up wanting to be a ballet conductor, a dance conductor, a conductor in general? No, um, I grew up thinking I was supposed to be a doctor, but my, my mother luckily also encouraged me to pursue music. And when I realized it was possible to actually do it as a career, I just thought, okay, I will do it. But I studied voice. And then it was about halfway through college that I realized that I really loved the communal aspect of, of conducting. And so I started to pursue that more seriously. Interesting. And I just sort of gratefully fell into ballet conducting. Do you feel, um, being a teacher, do you feel a responsibility to inspire your students to pursue conducting or um, dance conducting? Not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel it my responsibility to encourage them to be the best musicians they can be and to use music to become great thinkers and great questioners and great members of society and to use their musical training in whatever they end up doing. So if they become a professional musician or a conductor, fantastic. I hope to have had some small part in their training for that. But if they become a lawyer or a businessman or um, a teacher or anything, I know that the skills that I've taught them will transfer, you know, those skills of working together and discipline and creativity, mm -hmm. um, all, all, of, all of that will help them regardless of what they do. So no, I don't pressure them to become a conductor um, in any way. I just want them to um, find who they are. 
I think some of our viewers would be curious how your preparation differs for, say, when you're going to conduct with Richmond Symphony versus Richmond Symphony and also the ballet. How do you prepare differently for those two how do I prepare differently? I mean, you, you first, you, you have to study the score regardless, and you have to study the score enough to be able to um, speak during rehearsal and, and hear things and uh, give visual cues with your hands to, to bring the musicians together uh, in art, artistry and also just in execution. And that takes a lot of score study. But for dance, there's an added layer to it. And that layer is um, obviously learning the, learning the dance. So I spend a lot of time in the studio. I mean, I, I love going to rehearsals and I go early on so that- I can attest to that, we see you. Yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> I know a lot. And I go, as I said, I go early because I like to see what's difficult for the dancers. I feel like if I go too late, then I don't, then I only see what, looks already polished and I want to mm -hmm. see what leaps are hard and what tempos are really crucial and where I really need to watch when they need me the most mm -hmm. and I feel like I get more out of the early rehearsals when I do that. Um, then I also have this tradition that whenever I have a score that's coming up um, with the with the Richmond Ballet is I, I uh, my husband joins me and we watch as many videos as we can find of other productions and we just I mean usually this happens uh when Nutcracker starts One, once I'm like in the middle of Nutcracker we start watching the February ballet and we watch you know four or five six seven versions of it and then we put them away and I only focus on the Richmond ballet versions and I and I learn the tempos as well as I can and then I convert any of my interpretive issues from tempo, because I don't have any control over that anymore, mm -hmm. to things like orchestral color and articulation. And I really think about how I'm going to highlight the orchestra while still giving the dancers what they need. That's so interesting. Um, as you were saying that, it was prompting me that that's very similar to how a ballerina would prepare. I remember watching videos of my favorite ballerinas, old VHS, stuff on YouTube, um, watching as many different versions of a ballerina do a role and you know pulling inspiration from that and then going into the studio and sort of letting all that go and putting my interpretation onto it but knowing the whole time i have all of that referenced in my brain of things that inspired me um, yeah. it's really interesting it's very similar approach i love that arts coming together yeah you know i have to say it also makes me realize how great the richmond ballet is I mean, sweet. thank you. The productions are just top notch. I just, I feel so fortunate. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite things was earlier this fall, Richmond Symphony um, combined forces with the ballet and they perform one of my all time favorite works, Carmina Barona by Carl Orff. Yeah. Obviously an incredible symphonic score, has a massive chorus, mm -hmm. four soloists, 16 dancers on stage and a pit full of musicians. And I just remember as a dancer that hitting that final chord and O Fortuna during the finale and having goosebumps radiate all over my body and thinking like, this is so epic. I can't imagine what it must've been like kind of, you know, being the ringmaster per se of taking all of these incredible arts and like melding them together. And you're in control of this whole entire magical moment. What was that like for you on the podium? <laughs> it's funny, you know, my students asked me the same question because several of my students were involved in the production as well as the Richmond Symphony Chorus and the Richmond Symphony Orchestra. Um, and they asked me, you know, was that a big power trip? And, and I joked that it was, but it's really not because I feel like the larger the scope of the um, production, the more you realize the importance of the whole team. So I was, I was on the podium not overwhelmed with power, but really overwhelmed with gratitude. It's overwhelming to realize how many individuals are working to make that possible. And so it's, it's almost the opposite of power in a way. I felt, I felt very grateful and very small, almost as if 
like you feel if you are out camping and you look up at the sky and you see all these all these beautiful stars yeah. that's how i felt i was the person on the ground looking at all these beautiful stars working very together cool to create this this piece that's awesome Erin. i want to close out our interview with something really fun other talk show hosts might call this a lightning round but we're going to call this here um at richmond valley in real time our Petite Allegro round. And Petite Allegro is the small, fast, quick little jumps that we do at the end of ballet class. So you're gonna be on the clock. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. What's your favorite piece of music? Oh, the one I'm working on. Okay. The Bach B minor mass. Okay. Favorite ballet score? Oh. Cinderella. First ballet you conducted? Fair enough. Favorite food? Mm -hmm. Pie, any kind of pie. Red or white wine? Mm, rose. Favorite quarantine activity? Oh, you know, I just got a new piano, a new old piano, so playing piano. Favorite composer? Oh. Bach. Beach or mountains? Mm, yes. Beach. Yes to both. both. Yes. Beach, <laughs> beach, beach. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Aaron, we truly couldn't pull off our performances without you. Rich Mally misses you. We love you. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this today. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you, Val. Take care. Thanks, you too. If you'd like to learn more about some of the incredible arts organizations that Aaron works with right here in Virginia, make sure to check out Richmond Symphony Chorus, Virginia Commonwealth Singers, and Wintergreen Arts. As you can see, even when we're not in the studio or performing in the theater, arts bring us all together. This is Valerie Tom and Henning signing off from our first episode of Richmond Valley in real time, reminding you stay home, stay safe, stay positive, and by all means dance like nobody's watching. <laughs>